Recording in progress. So, welcome everybody. For those people who don't speak Ukrainian, it's recommended to take one of those because we will have guest speakers who speak in Ukrainian. So we are here together in what used to be the Russian house in previous years. Today it's no longer the Russian house, but it is the Russian war crime house, a project that um, is presented by the Viktor Pinchuk Foundation, the Pinchuk Art Center, together with the Office of the President of Ukraine and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine in partnership with Pravda Ua, one of the biggest media outlets from Ukraine. We present here an exhibition that focuses on war crimes that Russia is committing against civilians in Ukraine. We have only verified images, we have only verified data. In total, the exhibition, including the video that you will see later, has more than 4,600 evidence pieces of those war crimes. Now, let me introduce you to the founder of the Viktor Pinchuk Foundation and the Pinchuk Art Center, who is here to welcome us, Viktor Pinchuk. Thank you, Bjorn. Uh, dear friend, thank you for joining us uh, for the opening of um, War Crimes House. You know, for six years, I was involved in the building of memorial Babi Yar. Babi Yar, this is a place uh, where in 1941 German Nazis committed genocide against Ukrainian Jews. During two days, 34,000 Ukrainian Jews were killed and we, we tried to build this memorial with the dream that some, nothing like that will happen with a dream never again. And the things, uh, 24th of February this year, uh, things, uh, Russian invasion, we see that genocide against Ukrainians by Russians happening now. We understood that Unfortunately, never again didn't work. But when we uh, build this memorial, we knew that 
truth about that tragedy uh, was hidden. First, by Nazi, German Nazi, and second, by Soviet communists. And now we can see this genocide almost online. And we know that killers, they, they know that we see. And maybe, maybe it, it will stop them. If we will tell this story, if we tell this story loudly, if we will tell this story about this tragedy as wide as possible, maybe it will save some lives. Maybe we hope that it will politicians all around the world to send weapons quicker, to impose sanctions more severe, and we hope that it will save some lives. We don't need never again in the future. We need stop now, immediately. That's why, that's why we are here, because we understand the responsibility of private sector especially Ukrainian private sector, to help the governments to tell this story as wide as possible, as loud as possible. That's why today we are in Davos. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pinchuk. And now we have with us online um, the head of the office of the president, Mr. Yermak, and I hope we will see him now on the large screen. So, as often can happen, it takes some time. Yes. We can talk? Welcome. We yes. can hear you, we can hear you, but we yeah. cannot yet see you. So, I hope that this will be, that will, this will be fixed in a second. My apologies, there is a small technical issue, but we'll be solving it very fast. Yes, now we can see you. Welcome. And we, uh, just a moment, we cannot hear you now. So, if uh, Mr. Yermak, we cannot hear you now, we will try to solve that as well. Okay, now here? Yes, we do. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, thanks for having me here. I think today, this event, it's a very important. We world should know the truth. Home. Home is comfort, a place where you are well and safe. Home is world view and place where your wishes come true. Home is future, a place where your children grow. Home is universe, the place where the journey begins. At our home, at my country, in Ukraine, where is the war? Hordes of butchers, rapids, and murderers in Russian uniforms brought it. They look like humans being, but they do on or our lands deprives them of the right to be called a human. Where home is really the resistance of evil. This should be said directly and clearly because what's the day the truth is told. From now on war uh, crimes in Russia's second name and amending the name of once the Russian house in Davos, it's not just symbolic. It's honest, it's fair, for it's exposing both Russians' worldview and Russians' universe. Anybody can see its truth by themselves. Anyone can learn and the names of those whom the so-called Russian liberators liberated from everything, from peace, from freedom, from life itself. Very often for a fun and pleasure, 
Still, I'm going to tell you a couple of the life story, real stories of our people. This is a stories of Ukrainian children, victims of the war, victims of genocide against the Ukrainian people. On April 9, Russian troops shelled Vugledar, its city in Ukraine. 10 years, old Veronica's hometown. They had shelled it on the 8th and on the 7th and the day before. All the time, the girl and her uh, family, they're hiding in the basement. The tanks shell flew right into the ventilation window. In the moment, Veronica lost her father, her grandmother, her uncle, and his wife. The girl has been in a coma for the several days. Doctor says she got several spinal cord and brain injuries. Veronica can walk already. She is working hard to exercise her paralyzed right arm. And here the story of the 10 years old Ilya. His native city, a name of the city now famous in all the world, Mariupol, became a war zone from the very beginning of the full-scale Russian invasion. He and his mother Natalia stayed in the city. And the first they had been hidden in their house basement. And they, they, they lived there. One day they came under enemy fire. They ran to their neighbors for shelter. But like betrayed them, the woman was wounded in the head and the boy's foot was crushed. Somehow Natalia brought her son uh, to safety. Wounded and exalted, they lay on the couch. Natalia was hugging Ilya while her heart is beating. She was gone that night. The next day, the Russian military forcibly took the boy to occupy Novazovsk. Then he was brought to Donetsk. Local doctors fraud of amputating Ilya food. But he was lucky this time. Meanwhile, Ilya grandmother in Ukraine was looking for a way to get her grandson back. She quickly obtained custody and she crossed the borders of four countries to take him home. But first the boy had to get long-term inpatient treatment. One day, Ukrainian doctors said Ilya legs was fully functional and he would be able to walk. He considered the day his second birthday. Ilusha can already move his toys. He is very determined to recover. He gets very joyful, then gets come to, he, uh, to him. But sadness remain in his eyes. It is impossible to imagine what this boy had to survive. His pain cannot be forgiven. This is, are just two stories. As of May 21, where were 660 more stories of wounded and killed children, what we knew, no, knew for sure. But it's impossible to say the exact number of kids who lost their health and lives to the Russian invasion. The war is still going on in Ukraine. None of these stories are about collateral damage. Where are about genocide, Russian soldiers killed Ukrainians because we are Ukrainians. The Russian army is destroying Ukraine because it's Ukraine. This is the purpose and the goal of the invasion. Russian cars in uniforms seems to use the December 1948 UN Convention's definitions of genocide as a sources of their inspiration. Not a punishment warning, an additional to murders, torture and mutilation because of belonging to the certain group, reductions and privation of the childbirth and also of the least. 
You might have seen footage of the maternity hospital bombed in Mariupol. But it's not we only one. Dozens of them, they destroyed all over Ukraine. And there are thousands of damaged hospitals, schools, in kind, uh, gardens. Forcible transfer of the children to other groups in also the sign of genocide. Well, according to the Russian sources, as of May 21, the state sponsor of terrorism had deterred over 232,000 children to its territory. Other 2,000s of them it's, are either orphaned or separated from their parents. Meanwhile, the Russian parliament is preparing to simplify the Ukrainian children adoption by Russian nationals. It's not about humanism. It's not about a frenzy or hatred and destruction under the slogan of humanism. Genocide is one of the wildest crimes known to mankind. It employs pathological sadists, gullible fools, and greatest thirsty duffers. But the worst things is that silent people endorse it. The people who has lost their humanity because of the fear of their own tyrant. Davos, it's a place of strength. For the half of the century, a new world has been created here. If I were honored to create the Davos Forum slogan, I think I would suggest respect, synergy, concord. But today, we knew that new world is being born in my country, in Ukraine. We are defending from the brutal and ruthless force. We are resisting an empire that sees genocide and crimes against humanity as routine, not taboo. But we are fighting not just for ourselves. The fate of Europe and the world is a stake. Evil has to be stopped for the future sake. It's always come back if it's not unpunished. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Yermak, for these very powerful words. Now, following um, Mr. Yermak, we have a special guest again from Ukraine with us. She is the General Prosecutor of Ukraine, Irina Venediktova. I hope that this time we have her faster on the screen and we will be able to hear her well. So once again, we have to wait a little bit to have her here. My apologies, My apologies for these, for uh, these uh, small technical twitches. Already. Now Already. we, we can hear you and we can see you. Good morning. Great. Good morning. Good morning, dear ladies and gentlemen. It's order, a real honor to me to share this time with you, to have opportunity to discuss the war in Ukraine, very aggressive, brutal war, and I'm very appreciative that you have done such event. There should be a great effort to secure justice and conformity with international law. Peace and justice are two sides of the same coin. I hope you remember these words, these words of President Eisenhower, pronounced in 1957 regarding the Suez crisis. Could not be more fitting and appropriate in relation to the grave human rights and international humanitarian law violations taking place in Ukraine. Today, Ukraine is fighting, fighting for its sovereignty, independence, and peace in Europe and the world. 
I agree with Mr. Yermak totally. It was a really very strong uh, speech. And I agree. International community has condemned military aggression and invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Moreover, unprecedented number of 43 member states have referred the situation in Ukraine to the International Criminal Court, and the Office of Prosecutor has launched an investigation into alleged war crimes and crimes against humanity. Notwithstanding this, for 89th day, uh, heinous crimes are being committed by Russian forces in Ukraine. This is documented by domestic and international investigations, journalistic probes, human rights organizations reports, inquiries implemented under auspices of international organizations, etc. All evidence indicates that the Russian military and political elite has unconditionally reverted to the brutal war tactics of violence, sowing fear and torturing civilians. Civilian population and civilian objects, including hospitals, educational facilities, and residential buildings are internationally targeted in a widespread and systematic manner, typical of atrocity crimes. Violations by the Russian armed forces documented by investigators and prosecutors amount to unspeakable, deliberate cruelty and violence against civilians. This is particularly apparent in territories that were a front line of war, which practically became a slaughterhouse. Scale of barbarism and killings discovered there are, no to, no, uh, there are now no bounds, be it in Kiev region or recently liberated Kharkiv or Chernihiv regions. Summary executions, practice of torturing and mutilations, horrific cases of rape as a predominant method of warfare. Recording stopped. Including rape of minors, targeting and shooting of civilians in street, as well as freshly dug mass grave sites found a grim reality of today's Ukraine. It does not end there. Russia uses the practice of forced transfer of civilian population, and especially children, to Russian territories. Tens of thousands of people were already forcibly relocated. Children are separated from families, and put into the foster care system available for adoption in Russia. One can only imagine the stress children are going through. Russia also opened makeshift filtration camps, detaining and subjecting civilians to brutal interrogations and torture for any supposed links uh, to the Ukrainian government. This is a well-known practice used in Chechen wars. To date, over 60, uh, no, sorry, not 60, uh, 46, 4,600 civilians uh, have died, including 232 children. Unfortunately, this number does not include data from temporary occupied territories. However, what we can observe from satellite images and other sources, uh, the situation there is catastrophic. Moreover, 75 civilian objects were targeted, and the majority of them destroyed throughout Ukraine. Many cities and towns are simply burned to the ground. For today, we have already initiated close to 13,000 um, cases which are connected only about war crimes. In these categories, uh, suspicions was reported to 49 individuals which we started to prosecute in war crimes. From other side, we have one, our, um, one of our main cases, it's like an anchor case about crime of aggression. In this case, we have more than 600 um, suspects. Currently, we have two cases that are being held by courts against three defendants. Moreover, we are closely cooperating with the International Criminal Court to assist them in the investigation. Investigation is also ongoing in the format of joint investigation team created together with Lithuania and Poland and supported by the Eurojust, 
which also included International Criminal Court. It actually was first time uh, for ICC when they decided to join to a joint investigation team. In addition, 18 national jurisdictions initiated criminal proceedings regarding international crimes taking place in Ukraine. Thus, on the one hand, law enforcement authorities of Ukraine in unison with international community are doing everything to investigate crimes and hold perpetrators responsible. Is this, however, sufficient, though? Painful history of world, uh, of world wars shows that peace and stability can only be achieved when accountability for the crime of aggression and grave violations of international humanitarian law is ensured and when justice is restored. At the moment, Russia is attempted to redraw world map and undermine international rule of law. This revives the worst memories of the 20th century and threatens to crash prospects of secure and prosperous future for generations to come. International community cannot allow this to happen. Russia far too often got away with the blatant violations of international law. The syndrome of impunity should be overcome. Architects of Russia's political and military policy should get a first-hand experience of effects of rule-based system, both of the level of state as well as individual criminal responsibility. We need to restore trust in international law on a global scale. This could be achieved only by advanced justice and accountability. Yes. I started the uh, words of great person and want to finish again the words of Martin Luther King. Injustice anywhere is the threat to justice everywhere. Whatever affects one directly, affects all indirectly. Faster we all realize this and, uh, this and to act upon it, sooner it will have effect on the ground. I'm very appreciated for a time. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Mrs. Uh, Finetiktova. Um, now we are incredibly short in time, so I propose to make a small change in the way that we do the schedule. We have the honor to have the president of Latvia with us, to whom we will still listen, and then we have um, Ludmila Denisova, who is the Ukrainian Parliament Commissioner for Human Rights. We have also the mayor of Bucha here with us, Anatoly, Anatoly Fedoruk, and um, the mayor of uh, Militopol, uh, Ivan Fedorov. And we have a witness who came specially from Mariupol, um, Oksana uh, Kirsanova. But um, we will listen very shortly to um, the president of Latvia, and then we will perhaps give the others the word later um, at the press point and not any longer through the discussion. Or we can listen one minute to them. Yep. Thank you very much. President of Latvia. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear Ukrainian friends, I visited Kiev uh, one month ago, met President Zelensky, and I visited also uh, Berodyanka, which was a very impressive and uh, sad visit uh, to see the atrocities which uh, Russia committed in Ukraine. Uh, I will shortly continue what uh, Madam uh, Prosecutor General said about the responsibility. I think it is uh, crucial that the international community, the states, uh, are not tolerating such a flagrant violation of international law. And it is not only in the interest of Ukraine, it's the interest of the international community, of all states in the world, of all states in the world, to, uh, to uh, punish Russia for such a kind of uh, uh, violation of uh, UN Charter. Uh, there are uh, several possibilities on international level. Uh, as uh, Madam Pro General Prosecutor already said, the uh, International Criminal Court already started investigations uh, on uh, Russian uh, um, war crimes in Ukraine. Uh, this, uh, will, uh, this is a problem of uh, finding uh, evidences for uh, concrete Russian persons. And I think that Ukraine will uh, provide all the evidences. Uh, 
So International Criminal Court, the second court, which is dealing already with uh, Russia, uh, Russia's responsibility is the International Court, UN International Court, and there is a request of Ukraine on, uh, uh, against Russia, not for uh, the starting of aggressive war, but for false accusations of Ukraine for genocide. Why such a, uh, such a uh, request? Because the international uh, court is, in the, in the given case, not uh, responsible or not, uh, have not jurisdiction for the beginning of, international, of aggressive war. And therefore, uh, very important is to promote the idea to establish a special tribunal on uh, Russia's war against Ukraine. There is uh, uh, some examples, for example, uh, International Tribunal on Yugoslavia. And uh, such could be established also uh, on Russia's aggression against Ukraine. And uh, just a few days ago, European Parliament adopted a resolution where uh, European Parliament supports this idea. I think uh, this should be uh, uh, should go uh, go further. And the last question I will uh, touch is the uh, question of reparations. Uh, Russia is responsible uh, also for the building of Ukraine for reparations. And uh, there are several uh, hundred of billions of dollars which are now uh, assets which are now seized by the international sanctions and we should work uh, that this seized assets uh, not remain only seized, but also uh, they should be confiscated and uh, given to the special fund for rebuilding Ukraine. There are several uh, legal problems on that, I know that, and, uh, but uh, we should uh, uh, work together in order to overcome these legal prob uh, problems and uh, also to seize the assets so that there could be a, a real uh, a real um, uh, help for Ukraine to rebuild uh, the country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Now I give the word to Ms. Denisova. Good afternoon, we are from Ukraine. Who is suffering more from military actions, from military conflicts? This is just the regular population that suffers, elderly people, women, children. Every day we receive at our hotline more than 700-800 of our citizens who tell us about military crimes from the beginning of whole scale intervention, 44,000 people called us who informed us about military crimes against 78,000. We have one more hotline which gives psychological support to victims. Who are these victims? These are people against whom such crimes were committed as sexual violation of rape. Those who were tortured. These are one and a half thousand people who addressed who were brave enough to talk about that to receive such psychological support from us. These are 500 cases of suicides. Who are these? These are mothers uh, who saw how their children were raped and they were uh, murdered, and these were children who were raped last week. Facebook banned me and uh, deleted the post in which I informed the uh, awful things that the Russian soldier is doing against our women and uh, children because I violated moral ethical norms. Is that me? Is that Ukraine who violated? No, well, the world, wake up. I have the instruction from the parents who called this hotline, and they wanted me to inform you that Russian enemy systemically everywhere and with awful uh, cruelty is committing such acts. Uh, the girl was raped, uh, who is six months old, by teaspoon, Twins, boys, 
two years old. They were raped and they died. And the mother committed suicide. Three-year-old boy was raped and he died. I can continue. Do you understand? What is it? This is the tactic of the war of Russian Federation on eliminating Ukrainian people. That's military crime, crime against humanity and has the signs of genocide. That is a separate weapon of Russian Federation, which it uses to eliminate and to destroy Ukrainian morals. But they will not succeed in that. Thanks to the event that we have today, Thanks to Mr. Pinchuk, we are talking about that, and we are talking about that. We'll be talking about it so that the world knows, so the world feels the shame that the Russian soldier walks into our souls, so that you know about it. Back in 2008, the, uh, the Council of Security of the UN and Russian Federation voted for that. They said that there could be no truth if there is a sexual violation that complicates negotiations. There could be no negotiations and the sanctions cannot be stopped. That is why I tell all of you, if you anyone wants peace, yes, we want peace, but not at the sake of the, our women, um, girls and boys, only thanks to the victory of our people and we will have it. Glory to Ukraine. Oksana uh, Kirsanova, who came from Mariupol, worked there as a doctor. In Mariupol, there were many awful things happening, but I will tell you my, what I saw myself. I am the doctor anesthesiologist. I worked in the uh, regional hospital. From the first days of the war, many wounded people were brought to us. First, these were military, then civilians. The situation was getting worse and worse with every day. First, the light was off, then water was off. When the communication got off, it was most awful thing because we were separated from the whole world. We didn't know what's happening in our country. We didn't know what was happening in our city. When they uh, cut off the gas, people had to cook in the street, on the fire, under the shellings, and there were more and more wounded people. There were children among them, small children. And they were brought in a very critical condition, and you can see that on photographs, and we could not help them. We worked without windows. The, uh, was, the temperature was... Uh, uh, very cold, and because of the shellings, there were windows broken. We were manage we were trying to uh, close them, and again there was shelling, and uh, the window would be broken. On the 9th of March, after the Russian uh, military uh, shelled the, the bomb near the maternity house, they started bringing pregnant women to us. We didn't have the maternity ward in our hospital, but we would give them assistance. One woman died on our hands. That was awful, that was scary. That was a young woman, and she had uh, uh, traumas, and uh, the uh, hip was just broken. The surgeons uh, made the scissors uh, section, but the baby was born dead. We tried to reanimate the uh, child baby, but it was in vain. Can you imagine how you put into this black sack a young woman and a baby who had to live and live on? That was the most awful day. On the 12th of uh, March, our hospital was seized by Russian military, they came, they were undressing our uh, men, uh, doctors, they were looking for military, they put their equipment along the perimeter of the hospital, they were shelling from the hospital to the residential houses, all people who lived in residential houses, they would take them into hospital, these were hundreds of uh, people with children, with animals, with pets. They were everywhere. 
and uh, there was anti-sanitary uh, conditions in the hospital. We didn't have medicines. All the uh, cars and trucks that would come to the hospital, they would shell them. We saw that. The car is coming, someone who was trying to get out, they were killed uh, on the spot. And that's why we had fewer uh, wounded people. Uh, people could not get to the hospital. The uh, wounded people were brought, just uh, the people were carrying them in their arms. And we understood that there's no sense to stay in the hospital. When we came to them and asked, can we go out? They said, yes, you can go out, but you will be shelled at. You will be uh, shot at. And uh, we saw that. It was scary, but it was also so scary to stay in the hospital. And we took the risk. We left the hospital, and then we saw our town. It was uh, These were houses which were burnt and destroyed, demolished. And we walked for 20 kilometers under shellings, there were shells explode, exploding nearby, but we came to the highway. That was the first day when they would let cars out of the town. And uh, on the highway, some people just picked us up and uh, took us out of uh, Mariupol. We passed 20 block posts of Russia, and then we saw Ukrainian flag. It was a happiness. We were at home. We were at least in some uh, relative, but still some safety. But I have a big dream. I have a dream and a hope that I will go back to Ukrainian Mariupol that will build our city, Mariupol. Thank you. Thank you very much for this incredible witness. Now I give the word to Mr. Fedoruk, uh, Mayor of Bucha. Thank you, esteemed ladies and gentlemen. It's very difficult to talk because of, of what we've heard and what we survived through. But we have to do it. We have to do it so that the whole world hears what is done, what is committed in Ukraine by Russian occupants. And I believe that the World Economic Forum is the platform where right now uh, Ukraine should be present and they need to talk about the crimes of the Russian Federation on the territory of Ukraine. Russian Federation violated all the rules of waging the war and international uh, rules. Even the war has some rules. They uh, violated even the Bible. Don't kill, don't rob, don't rape. They were raping, they were killing, and they were uh, robbing, uh, looting. And why should they, why were they to kill the peaceful civilians of our town? And there were many people like that. These were peaceful people people who were trying to survive. They were going to the hospital to the point of humanitarian aid, and they were just shooting them. And because of that, we need to ta talk, that we need to talk how to stop it today and stop it for the future. I am asking why, why they were acting like that. And you journalists are asking the same question. Why? Because the crime wasn't punished in the, in the past. The Russian aggressors could not feel criminal responsibility for their past crimes. There was no military uh, court. Uh, they were not uh, judged. Uh, we, uh, like it was after the Second World War, but we, as the civilized world, as the democratic world, we have to stop such actions uh, and, uh, and uh, the actions which are unfortunately happening on the territory of our state, of my town, of other settlements. And I am really uh, very grateful for this opportunity to talk to you, for this opportunity to be present here at the forum. Uh, Mr. Viktor Pinchuk, I thank you for inviting me and for such organization so that we can talk about that so that we can focus attention on that. And I'm grateful that I see my colleague, uh, Mr. Troshenko, the mayor of Chernigov. I've just heard him when I was in occupation. I heard how he w was talking to his citizens and talking to the whole world, how the city is uh, 
uh, opposing, resisting in occupation. I'm happy that I uh, survived, but I am so sorry that 419 peaceful civilians, citizens of Bucha, were uh, killed, were tortured during this war, this aggression. But we sincerely believe that there will be justice. And what M Madam Venediktova said, uh, uh, every crime will be investigated and will be taken to the, the war tribunal. Uh, and I believe in that. And I believe in our uh, common victory, the victory of the whole democratic world that is united. Because this is actually the Third World War, like it's happening. And unfortunately, in the east of Europe, on the territory of Ukraine, there are full-scale military actions going on. We need to understand that wherever we are, in Ukraine, in Switzerland, in Portugal, in the US, but we need to understand that that is the Third World War. We do believe in our victory, glory to all of us, and glory to Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you say very shortly one minute some words. Thank you for your invite. Uh, in terms of opportunity, we can start the war, starting the war with Ukraine, but all civilized world closed their eyes in a war, on a war from Ukraine. Until last eight years, nobody keep on silent and ask uh, Ukraine, don't give uh, military answers for Russians. What we see now? Till eight years, Putin come again to Ukraine, come again and occupate many of our cities southeast of Ukraine. Putin said all over the world that he take a greatest support for our civilian peoples, from our Ukrainian, for our legally elected representative. And what we see now? We see opposite situation. Nobody gives support to Putin. Not civilians, not legally elected representatives. That's why now Putin start to make a genocide from our Ukrainian civilian citizens. Now he blocked our occupied cities. People can't leave occupied cities as Melitopol, Kherson, Berdyansk, and other cities. They, we can't deliver humanitarian aid. We can't deliver pharmacy. And it's a very dangerous situation because he kidnapped every day many thousands of our citizens. In Melitopol, he kidnapped more than 500 civilians. Somebody he, he held more than three days, and uh, for example, one 16 year, 60 years old children, he kidnapped more than one month. Without liberate of our towns, without liberation of our citizens, we have no future of Ukraine, we have no future of European Union, and of course, in Davos, re regularly built a new strategy. We can't build strategy with killer Putin and with Russian who start war in middle of Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much for these powerful words. Thank you, everybody. We have still um, some people who are here for interviews. Ms. Denisova will stay here to give an interview. Some of the mayors will be here. I myself will be here. Thank you very much for your attention. And I think the video will start now. with sound. У стражданнях, яких бували в квартирах, в будинках, підриваючи гранатами, давили танками, просто, просто давили танками в цивільних автівках посеред дороги. Заради задоволення, які відрубали кінці. Uh, hands and uh, feet, and they were raping and killing the children. They would uh, take off their tongue because they could not hear what they wanted to hear. Is it different from what the terrorists uh, are doing on the territories which they occupy? And uh, uh, that is what the member of the Security Council of the UN is doing. They are ruining the borders. They are taking off the right from people for their independent lives. They are conducting the policy of eliminating uh, the um, 
uh, identity and they are instigating the war so that to kill as many as possible regular peaceful people and to ruin regular peaceful cities. So the voices that you hear here are um, the voices of Russians who are calling to um, their loved ones in, in Russia telling what they have been doing in Ukraine. So these are parts of the evidence that are collected to prove the war crimes that are happening. Um, and these voices you can hear on the background while seeing images that have been taken um, in Ukraine by mostly Ukrainian photographers of only civilian targeting and civilian killing. Dead. They smell well. I have the whole apartment in my pocket. Yeah. Everything's burning. Yeah, I robbed to find some food. In my eyes, yes. Tell, tell, yeah, we are looting. Let's, let's loot it. Let's, let's uh, rob it. Let's find some food. I was going. I I went looting. What's going on? Your, your plan is over now. Okay, there's a big speech with four persons. The skin gets off the fingers. What's next? And. What's next? Yes, we were uh, stealing from a shop. Yeah. 
Yeah, I just shot everyone. I raped. Yes, I was looting. Uh, which Russian wouldn't steal? Yes, I went looting. Where? Looting. Yeah, yeah tell me. Uh, did you rape Ukrainian women? In my eyes? This, yes, we surrendered. We went looting. Our guys are raping. Yes, yes, you do it. You rape Ukrainian women. You rape them. So I have not a drop of pity. I don't pity them. I don't pity them. Whatever they have, children, not children, fuck it all. Cannot you take a phone from any one of them and call me every day? Yes, do it, do it. Rape Ukrainian women. Yeah, just do it. Fuck it. Are you here? Well, uh, we were allowed to just shoot, and we don't care. We don't care. Yes, rape Ukrainian women. Do it. Do it. Which Russian wouldn't steal? Yes, I went looting. Where? Looting. And I have not a drop of pity. Now you have two dead ones. Which Russian wouldn't steal? And you know how they we rape children? And the whole night like that, well, you wanted to go to the war, so you went. Everything is so tasty. They gave us uh, ice cream. Fuck it, it's so tasty. Uh, yes, there is some looting. And you know what? He shot him at the back and he had no pity. 